Namum Yohorengekyo. Thank you so much for being here today. I hope this finds you in good health and secure. Welcome to all the new subscribers. Um, it's slowly trickle in and uh, our Sangha continues to grow. It, I watch the numbers. I probably shouldn't, but you know, the numbers go up and then back and up a little more and then back. It's just, it's a slow climb. Um, but uh, all of that is just to say how deeply I appreciate um, your practice and your participation. And when you like and subscribe, you help uh, this resource become more apparent to those who are on YouTube and looking for perhaps this very resource. So um, it's very important work, and I appreciate you doing that. Um, I've been having sleep troubles. Um, I'm just thinking. The, today's video, we've the last couple of videos, we're, we're doing, of course, a series on uh, Nichiren's discussions of mandala and gohanzon. Uh, now we're in quite deeply into the opening of the eyes treaties, which I've already uh, described as basically Nietzsche's, uh definition of Gohonzon, the definition of the very aim of Buddhist practice, right? Which is the Lotus Sutra, Shakyamuni's teaching, his aim from the get-go uh, as Siddhartha Gautama to find a universal truth that any sentient being would be able to invoke, enliven, awaken to something pre-existent that, for lack of recognizing it, leaves us wandering in attachments and identification, the samsaric life, when in fact always beneath, around, within this engine of life that provides all of this functioning moment to moment we don't pay attention to we don't recognize we don't once we recognize it our profound sense of appreciation for this very mechanism that creates this moment to moment opportunity to experience everything it changes our perspective. It changes our sense of what it is to be alive, to be participating in the great engine of the universe, let alone life as it exists on this little planet, yeah? And so we've been talking about and it comes up a lot. You know, the tendency of uh, politics amongst, you know, as, as the world has become more populated, more competition for resources, more, uh, I mean, we live in a rampant capitalist society where everything is commodified. Everything is turned, even your very thoughts are turned into product now and marketed, sold to, sold with. So much of this involves our every thought that we're supremely distracted from just a moment of restful thought to consider dewdrops and the bird song and our breath and the amazing life yeah and so we've been talking about that a lot of controversy about that in everything and certainly it, it shows itself in the uh, the pockets of teachings and and uh, the characters the personas that position themselves as uh, who study. You got to give them credit for study, but they use that study uh, to take advantage of people. And this is, this is very lamentable. And Shakyamuni talks about it 3,000 years ago. 
I round up to 3,000, you know this. Uh, and certainly Nietzsche quotes several scholars in the lineage of Buddhist scholarship. And now we're going to dive into, it's almost like he's bringing us to this point where he's saying, okay, I'm Nietzsche and I have many followers, most of whom are samurai, by the way. I shouldn't say most, but a great many, yes. And um, the, the more he educates his followers about Shakyamuni's teachings and Tendai's teachings and Dengyo's teachings and Miao Lo's teachings and commentaries and Chinese um, uh, commentaries and stories and and uh, Taoism and Confucian. He's all over the place, right? Educating his followers to understand the significance, the profundity of what it is that the Lotus Sutra is actually saying and and promoting and leading to what is this self-realization, right? Rather than using the word self-realization, he uses the word gohanzen. What's our motive? Why do we even do this? What moves us? Where, where are we heading? And why is it important, right? This is the, this is the gohanzen question, Right? So he's made a tool, the man, the, this scroll that operates as a mandala, a, a way of focusing all of our samsaric consciousnesses to, to penetrate this wisdom, to, to see the goal. And through that doorway, that gateway, that alternate, way of perception and seeing the world, experiencing life. Oh, that experience, that is Buddha, yeah? Well, okay, that's all well and good, and we get that, and that's great, but there seem to be, and you may have noticed this in your practice, as you read different sutras or chapters or even go shows and you hear Nietzsche talking about these things the admonitions that are in there and some of them are quite severe and some of them use the abstraction of you know previous life after uh, not afterlife but uh, uh, following you know future life it's really talking about again moment to moment where was your head at before where is the your head at now and we're about to dive into this question that comes up about, well, if this is true, if we read it as fact, um, you know, why is this happening to you, Nietzsche? Or if that's true, then are you that person? Are you just assuming that? Are you just like all the other politicians, assuming a role? Right? These, these doubts, they come up, and they usually, when we have those doubts, they reflect our state of mind, really. But it's in the writing, so, you know, especially translations. So, what's going on? How can we be absolutely certain? It always comes down to this confidence thing, yeah? And so, what I, before we dive into it, I want you to think of this because there's there are large terms here that they talk about specific personages but they tend to be about tendencies human tendencies societal tendencies blah 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 it's easy to read that kind of thing and think that's other and that's we love to do that as humans right oh we're describing something let me put that in the warehouse of definitions and there we are identifying and not relating to our own experience and so I just wanted to say a few words in that regard and remind you that as we grow as human beings from childhood through puberty and then our teenage years, uh, young adult years into adulthood, and we continue to do this our entire life, 
There are always moments when we think back and think, how did I ever think that way? How did I, I mean, I was, I was so sure. I had such a strong idea and attitude and conviction about this or that. And now it's almost embarrassing. Gosh, how could I not see? Yeah. So I want you to remember that because in Buddhism, that's very part and parcel of the discussion of how the sentient mind works and how it's obfuscated by, quote, the monkey mind, the mind that's racing to... See, this is the answer. This is the answer to the question, how could I be so stupid or how could I think that way? Well, you thought that way, you're not there anymore, so you've forgotten. But when you were in the midst of that, you were attached to certain ideas. The voices in your head and the voices around you were all saying, that, 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 and so you, that's it. And only later, after you matured some more, had more experience, heard some of those voices for what, they were misrepresenting, saw around the corner of their politic. They were doing the same thing you were, but we're all convincing ourselves that we know, because we're still growing to understand life, the world, the society, our culture, our town, our families. And there's so much that's never said or talked about Because not everybody wants to air every thought they have. We don't have enough time. We can't speak fast enough to do that, right? I heard somebody say, and this just an aside, but just to make the point, somebody was talking about this AI thing that's growing now, chat GPT, and it's like, Artificial intelligence is is really a misnomer. It's it's codified and... and, uh, uh, augment, uh, not, it's not even intelligence. It's automated intelligence. It's algorithms collecting huge, my, my analogy, databases, warehouses of databases of information and identification. The difference is that when your mind, my mind, learns something, we learn it intimately and we keep, it's, it's never static. We might think it is. But, you know, this whole idea of facts, it's really kind of laughable. They're just pieces of information we hang our hat on for a time. And maybe the it holds true for a long time. Great. But more often than not, it slips in its truth or its efficacy and other factors start to play a larger role. This is the nat- natural order of our learning and our exposure to this life engine, yeah? And so, when we have uh, a breakthrough moment, um, it's like going up a ladder, another rung or step, whatever analogy you want to use, and we have a greater understanding, a more profound understanding. And oftentimes, and this is when it's most difficult, things that we've done, especially as we get older, will have more lasting effects in our environment, right? As we're young and we transgress many stages for a few years in our young life, Many of the mistakes or uh, injuries, harm that we create in our environment, we're either completely ignorant of or people just say, well, he's a kid or she's young, she doesn't know, right? But as we get older, our environment isn't as hmm, pliable. I was going to say forgiving, but it's not about forgiveness. It's about lasting impressions and influences, And it may take some time, and some people who feel either harm, injury, or the threat 
of injury because that's rumors and things, right? They don't even know you, but the word has spread that you're a this or a that. How do you counteract that? If you ply yourself to addressing it head on, generally that doesn't work very well. Generally, that just creates more noise about it and compounds the problem. More often than not, and perhaps always, the only path forward is to simply live your life differently and not be hung up on those that would maintain a previous indiscretion and refuse to observe your growth. Right? I'm sure all of us has experienced that on, on some level. It's, uh, it's kind of sad, but um, this is the nature of uh, human identification and warehousing and data, right? It's, it's just the way life is. So at some point, you have to decide, all right, this is the new me. This is my new directive. This is the way I'm going. And though I may, somebody may point out something that I've done that needs to be addressed, all I can do is make reparations if necessary, honor that, yes, you're right, I stepped on your toes. Here, what, what can I do? And if it's reasonable, do it and move on. Or recognize that it's just somebody hanging on to bad feelings and honor those bad feelings, apologize, I respect you, I do, you may not believe that, but I'm changing and growing, and I hope that that will serve, you know, to, to uh, um, mollify your, your, the harm that you feel that, you know, and, and that I'm now achieving, becoming a better person, I'm really working hard on it, I hope you can appreciate that, Right? Don't just walk away from it, but at the same time, you don't want to belabor it either because that just, again, compounds it, right? So this is life. What am I talking about? Is it really, you know, rocket science? No, this is all stuff we know. I say all of this because as we dive into these, these questions that Nietzsche is going to pose for his followers about doubt, about how they see Nietzsche and about how they see Buddhism, that all of the flowery talk, the personages and things he's going to quote are this dialogue. They are about this specifically in regards to Buddhism because none of us is perfect. And sometimes we don't practice with the chutzpah, with the energy, with the conviction that we ought to, to experience it fully. I'm not trying to guilt trip anyone here. I'm just saying it's the nature of samsara. Yeah? It's tough to stay focused. Boy, when something crappy happens, though, or you feel threatened, oh, suddenly you muster all kinds of <laughs> conviction, right? You've heard me say it before. When you're, when you're struggling in life, Go to your Buddhadan, open it up, look at your scroll, your mandala, start chanting and demand Buddhaness, right? Nietzsche says single mindedly seek Buddha. And I'm saying, yeah, single mindedly. Sometimes you got to be, no, I need, <laughs> I need my Buddha nature to, to run the ship here because I'm not seeing it, right? That's okay. I'm not saying get mad at your mandala or your, you know, what I'm saying is with that kind of energy, be strong, be demanding that you instantiate, but, but that's not what you do every day. There are times, though, when really what you're doing is talking, to your, you're giving yourself a stern, get with the program, son, right? You're not hurting the Butsudan's feelings. Or your Gohonzon's feelings. Your Gohonzon's sitting there going, I'm waiting for you to pay attention. That's why we call it awakening. 
You want to sleep throw, uh, sleepwalk through life and mope? I mean, I, I can't help you. You've got to do this. Right? It's your enlightenment. So, with all of that, blah, blah, blah. See if I have time to... <laughs> All right, so he continues. Someone may raise this question. It would surely appear that the three types of enemies are present today, but there is no votary of the Lotus Sutra. And as I've said before, even though this is medieval Japan and he talked about the three enemies, they certainly are apparent in our day today. Yeah. So, interesting question. Who's the votary of the Lotus Sutra then? I don't see them. I see all the enemies. Where's the votary of the Lotus Sutra? Can I clue you in on something before we continue? I know I'm giving away the plot here, but I really, really want you to, to hear this. You, you are the votary of the Lotus Sutra. I am the votary of the Lotus Sutra. This is our charge in this era. Why do I say that? How do I, did I just invent that? Absolutely not. We are the bodhisattvas from beneath the earth. We are those future bodhisattvas that Shakyamuni spoke of in the Lotus Sutra. He's got a whole chapter dedicated to us. And Nichiren tells us he's in various uh, ways different, he, whether it's uh, bodhisattva never dis, uh, de, never disparaging or bodhisattva superior practices, the one of the leaders of the bodhisattvas of the earth, he positions himself as our mentor, our leader, and what does he tell us to do? Emulate him. So I'm not making this stuff up. If you're looking for the votary of the Lotus Sutra, yeah, where is he? Where where or where is she, for that matter? Well, it's you. Yeah, it's a lot of responsibility, isn't it? But having all that responsibility is kind of cool. Because it means <laughs> you've got no one to blame. <laughs> if your life sucks right now, you can change it. That's powerful. So what do you choose to do? Cower down and go, life sucks? Or do you hear yourself say, life sucks, and go, shut the hell up. You can change this. Whatever suckage is going on in your life at the moment, it's the evolution and product of previous actions. This is the important key. Previous actions leading to these effects is the same language as Nietzsche is saying indiscretions from previous lifetimes are now manifest. You can't blame, you know, if you put dirt in water, there's going to be some mud. But you can get the mud out of there. You can clear it up and get back to clear water. It takes effort. Make sense? So this is the crux of everything Nietzsche is going to talk about here. So he continues. If one were to say that you, Nietzsche, are the votary of the Lotus Sutra, then the following serious discrepancies would become apparent. So let's say, let's entertain you, Nietzsche, and say, okay, you are the votary of the Lotus Sutra. You've given us all kinds of evidence in, in the texts. So let's test your theory. The Lotus Sutra states, quote, The young sons of heavenly beings will wait on him and serve him. Swords and staves will not touch him, and poison will have no power to harm him. But we've seen you almost get beheaded, sent away to Sado, people attacking you, people attacking your followers. Something doesn't seem to jive here. 
It also reads, if people speak ill of him and revile him, which they certainly did Nietzsche in his day, their mouths will be closed and stopped up. These are grand pronouncements, huh? So what do people expect? For like sci-fi movies now, the lips to disappear and whoom, the mouth to disappear? Of course not. But this is what's stated in the sutras, right? And it also states, the Lotus Sutra we're talking about, they who have heard the law will enjoy peace and security in their present existence and good circumstances in future existences. Right? We've heard that quoted several times. It also states, if there are those who trouble and disrupt the preachers of the law, votaries, their heads will split into seven pieces like the branches of the Arjaka tree. And furthermore, it reads, in this present existence, they, the practitioners of the Lotus Sutra, will gain the reward of good fortune. End quote. And it adds, if anyone sees a person who accepts and upholds the Sutra and tries to expose their faults or evils of that person, whether what he speaks is true or not, he will in this present existence be afflicted with white liberty. How do you explain these discrepancies? Now that's an important one because I've had that thrown in my face. And why is this question being asked? Nietzsche is asking the question. He, he sees where doubt could take hold. And he knows, he knows, I'm sure people pointed it out to him. Nietzsche was not shy about pointing out faults. Yeah, you could say, yeah, but he was pointing out faults in these other sects and this, the, their, their baloney politic and self-serving. Yeah, but they were still scholars of Buddhism. They still did a lot in their lives, committed to, they may have been, you know, bent, but they still put in the time. They should have some merit for that, right? just as Shakyamuni predicted that Devadatta would become a Buddha. Devadatta, very educated, but very evil, would at some point, dunk, get it, right? This is one of the conundrums of, of the study of this Buddhism, yeah? So Nietzsche he's not blind to his own actions and their repercussions. Hint, hint, attitude and intent. We'll get back to that. So he answers, answer. These doubts of yours are most opportune. Yeah, it's a good point to point out. Well, <laughs> it's a bit self-serving because he's the one asking the question. But nonetheless, he must sense it in his followers, yeah? I will take the occasion to clear up the points that puzzle you. This should be good. The never disparaging chapter of the Lotus Sutra states, quote, they spoke ill of him, Bodhisattva is never disparaging, and cursed him. Again, quote, some among the group would take sticks of wood or tiles and stones and beat and pelt him, end quote. The Nirvana Sutra states, quote, they will even kill him or do him injury. Yikes. Yeah, people don't like to be corrected. And oftentimes Buddhism seems like a correction, doesn't it? Because it's not mystical. It's very down to earth. It's how do you live your, your, li your life correctly, right? You know? I've gotten into it with several people who've come out of the woodwork to challenge me as a Buddhist and go, you know, and they want to promote their religious agenda. And I just keep swatting them down. And boy, they, it makes them angry. That's, they take it personally. But I really try hard, and I think successfully, to not make it personal. I just simply offer the Buddhist perspective on things and so they get angry but i don't know i've never had anyone threaten me physically maybe they have those thoughts but i don't know anyway 
The Lotus Sutra states, quote, Since hatred and jealousy toward this sutra abound even when the thus come one is in the world, how much more will this be so after his passing? Okay, so we've heard that a thousand times. We understand, right? That just because you're practicing the ultimate way of manifesting fully your potential to live an amazing life moment to moment, right? Without dragging the past along with you. You're not harming anyone, right? The harm somebody thinks, it's, it's their perception. It's because they're losing their, the ground, this, their ground of, of justification is like quicksand. And they think you put them in there, but they're the ones who chose to stand in the quicksand. They just don't see that yet, right? The Buddha encountered acts of hostility known as the nine great ordeals, such as being wounded on the toe by Devadatta, and yet he was a revotary of the Lotus Sutra, wasn't he? Right? What I just was saying about Devadatta actually tried to physically harm Shakyamuni Buddha. Jealous of him. And didn't Shakyamuni point out that not only would Devadatta become a Buddha, but that David Dada's life was dedicated to Buddhism. Isn't he a votary of Buddhism? Right? See, this is something easy to forget when we get wrapped up in these stories is the mental game that we all play in our heads. Hmm? And Bodhisattva never disparaging who, as we have seen above, was cursed and beaten. Was he not a votary of the one vehicle teaching? Hmm? He chose a certain path for that he was comfortable teaching in, right? Honoring everyone he met. That was his way of shoju, of spreading, propagating. Hmm? We all have our own way. Mount Galayana was beaten to death by a Brahmin group called Bamboo Staff. Sometime after the Lotus Sutra predicted that he would attain Buddhahood in the future. Among the 25 leaders in the lineage of Buddhism, the 14th, Bodhisattva Aryadeva, and the 25th, the Venerable Aryashima, were murdered. Yeah, it's not like we have invincible shields around us. So why is Nietzsche pointing all of this out? Sometimes life doesn't turn out the way you'd like it to. It's how you live in each moment that's important, though. Don't forget that, right? Attitude and intent. Doesn't make you invincible. But now... Here's how Nietzsche is going to address this. Were these men not votaries of the Lotus Sutra? Of course they were. Chu Tsao Sheng was banished to a mountain in Su Chao, and Fat Dao was branded on the face and exiled south of the Yangtze River. Were these men not upholders of the one vehicle teaching? Among scholars of secular learning, both Po Chui and Sugawara no Michizane who was posthumously revered as the god of Kitano Shrine, were exiled to distant places, and yet were, not, uh, were they not worthy men? If we consider the second part of your question, we must note the following points. Those who did not commit the error of slandering the Lotus Sutra in their previous life or existences moment moment to moment each moment is an existence right birthday 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 hmm? will become votaries of the lotus sutra in their present life this is the awakening hmm? if such persons should be subjected to persecution under a false charge 
of having committed worldly offenses, then those who persecute them ought to suffer some kind of immediate retribution. Makes sense, right? If something, if someone accuses you of something you haven't done, whether it's about Buddhism or not, then aren't they not the ones who should incur correction? Hmm? Some kind of effect for wrongfully accusing, trying to harm somebody, whether it be with words, accusations, whatever. Right? Is a liar not the one that should be called out? Makes sense. If should be, it should be like the case of the Ashuras who shot arrows at Chakra or the Garuda birds that tried to eat the dragon of Anavatapta Lake. But who both invariably suffer injury themselves instead? And yet Tendai says, quote, the ills and pains I suffer at present are all due to causes in the past, and the meritorious deeds that I do in my present life will be rewarded in the future. That little word salad there is exactly what I was trying in my word salad to explain earlier. Right? If we're dealing with hardships in our life that you know, oftentimes we throw up our hands and go, why is this happening to me? Right? Like we're victims of the great universe imposing itself on us. But really, if we were much more cognizant, if we really paid attention to how our life works, we would see, and we often do, we don't like to admit it, how we got ourselves into this mess. Usually we can see a pretty direct line to, uh, I screwed myself here. But also, quite often, things will happen to us long after we've made causes for that negativity to appear and we've completely forgotten about it. And we tell ourselves, uh, why is this happening to me? Well, rest assured, as Nietzsche is pointing out here, and so did Tendai, that whatever obstacle we're facing in our lives, it didn't appear out of, you know, some master controller, some evil underground info. It's, it ro arose out of our karmic engine. And that's important to remember because our karmic engine that manifests every moment has some recesses in it that we may not be quite aware of, right? Karma is vast. And there may be some tendencies and conditions, remember that phrase? In our lives, where we have made causes or stored causes of karma that at the time we had no idea we were causing harm. I didn't, who the, yeah, I remember saying that when I was, you know, 10 or, or 15, but so what? I didn't hurt anyone. Oh, well, yes, you did. You just weren't aware of all of the people that your influence, your aura, your presence was affecting. Right? We're pretty darn tunnel visioned when it comes to our lives. Hmm. So Buddhism, Nichiren, Tendai, all of these scholars remind us, yes, you're working on your awakening and your, the perfection of your life experience. But in that awakening, make room for the fact that you haven't always been this knowledgeable, this aware, that you've done things that eh, you've got to get some of that mud out of the water. Don't ask yourself why it's there. You know why it's there. It's something you've been dragging along. Now you have the opportunity to address us. Ah, that's an opportunity. It's not something imposed upon you. It's an opportunity for you to cleanse. Do 
Do you see the attitude? Right? It's not one we're taught culturally. But it's one we need to develop and the only way to develop it is to keep awakening Gohanzan. Keep Gohanzan gate open. So that, because Buddha Ness sees this as obvious. Uh, opportunity, cool, something to do. But our monkey mind, our database, that's the one that makes it, uh, right? It brings us down. That, that should be a trigger. The moment you start feeling that heaviness or the whatever, you know what it is. Oh, oh, I need to chant. <laughs> I need to turn this poison into medicine. Hendoku yaku, right? That's what that's about. That's why earthly desires are enlightenment. Because of those pains, those are all born of tendencies and conditions, which are what? Earthly desires may not see them clearly, but you certainly feel them. You may not see the causation, but rest assured, if you feel the effect, the cause is there. And knowing what it specifically was is not important. What's important is to, with your enlightened mind, address, mollify, eschew, convert whatever that is, however it presents itself as an opportunity for a springboard to move you deeper, more profoundly into Buddha-ness. Shared opportunity with others. It may be that if something really upsetting comes up in your life involving other people, that that's your cue to start teaching them the one vehicle. You want to make reparations? Help them attain enlightenment. What more powerful thing could you do or offer, Mr. Mrs. Votary of the Lotus Sutra? Okay. Likewise, the contemplation on the Mind Ground Sutra, another teaching of Shakyamuni's, says, if you want to understand the causes that existed in the past, look at the results as they are manifested in the present. And if you want to understand what results will be manifested in the future, look at the causes that exist in the present. Man, that's a refrigerator magnet right there. That's something you can write down, put on your mirror in the bathroom. You remember those positive affirmation things we used to do? Think carefully about this one quote. It was very important to me for a long time. It still is, but I don't often remember it anymore. And let me paraphrase it a different way. If you're looking at your life right now and you're going, how in the hell did I get here? Well... It's kind of uh, an ignorant question. No insult meant. But we tend to operate with a lot of ignorance. We choose not to look at our own behavior for one. The point is, if you are looking at your life right now and maybe you feel really great about it, cool. Either way, whether you feel great about it or whether you have regret about it, the, the main point is, you didn't get here by accident. This life you're experiencing isn't happening to you. The life you're experiencing right now, this moment, this moment, this moment, is a result of previous moments. It's an accumulation of your actions. So if you like it, great, keep doing that. If you don't like it, then something has to change. Duh. 
And sometimes it can be so obscure that you say, well, Sylvain, okay, I want to change it. But what am I changing? Ah, weed hoppa. <laughs> this is the amazing practice of chanting. Taking our mindset and enlightening it with a clear vision of how we're moving into the next moment, the next moment, the next moment, will itself bring about an influence, a change, a mollifying, a redirection, so that the future is not an effect of the same past causes. And you know what? Sometimes it may mean that we have to burp up Something very uncomfortable. See, and this scares people when they practice, They're early practicers, especially year one, year two. Suddenly obstacles come up. Oh, I got to stop practicing this Buddhism. My God, my life is a mess. It's not a mess because you practice Buddhism. You're getting to see the mess that you haven't been paying attention to before. And now that you see it glaring in your face is your opportunity to go poof and get rid of it. How do you get rid of it? Redouble your efforts. Namo myo renge kyo. Now's where I need my Buddha nature. Ah. What an amazing practice, yeah? So yeah, I'm going to read that one again. If you want to understand the causes, I should highlight it. If you want to understand the causes that existed in the past, look at the results as they are manifested in the present. And if you want to understand what results will be manifested in the future, look at the causes that exist in the present. What are you doing right now to direct your future life? That's so powerful. The never disparaging chapter of the Lotus Sutra says, quote, when his events, offenses had been wiped out, end quote. This indicates that Bodhisattva never disparaging was attacked with tiles and stones because he had in the past committed the offense of slandering the Lotus Sutra. What does that mean? Does that mean that when you knew nothing of Buddhism, you said something disparaging about Buddha? No, that's not what that means. Because disparaging the Lotus Sutra isn't about the Lotus Sutra. It's about myoho renge kyo. It's about Buddhahood, Buddha nature. And when we're ignorant that that is even available for us to witness, we make assumptions and Opinions galore from a place of being victims, being imposed upon by the great universe and the gods, unable to do anything about our lives. We're slandering our own enlightenment. That's what that means. We constantly have this potential for enlightenment to live life to the full and we actively work against it. That is slandering the Lotus Sutra. Do you see? Next, we should note that persons who are inevitably destined to fall into the hell of incessant suffering in, uh, in their existence, in, in their future, even though they commit grave offenses in this life, will suffer no immediate punishment. The Achantikas are examples of this. Some people live in ignorance their entire lives. And they seem to get away with it, right? How many times have you said this or heard somebody say, yeah, all those rich so-and-sos, they seem to be able to get away, you know, 
war crimes, all those kind of things. How do those, why can't I get away with it, right? Oh, that's a dangerous place to go. But right, I mean, I remember when I was younger thinking, why do I have to work so hard to be good? Look at these jerks. They get away with everything. But if you understand Buddhiness, Buddhist practice, then you absolutely know the universe balances always. So a person that looks like they're getting away with whatever, they may suffer in ways you, you and I don't even understand. And it may take a while for it to manifest in their life, but it will. It has to. Again, you must have confidence that cause and effect are immediate and that they express themselves when it is suited for them to express themselves. So never begrudge your life. Never begrudge that I've been practicing 10 years and why is this crap happening to it? Well, you should be thankful. Wow, this crap is something. I, ooh, how did I, have I not addressed this yet? Go, I need to go to Gohanzan. I need to sit in front of my mandala and get my Gohanzan open. I need to, I need my Buddha nature to finally get past this, change it repair it, whatever it needs. I need to break through it. It's holding me back. Right? Namo Myodengeko. Thank you for listening. Thank you for your practice. Thank you for subscribing, liking. Your purchases of the ebooks on threefoldlotus.com. A great support to keep this channel going, or the print books on lulu.com, right? Or your donations through Patreon or PayPal. It's critical to keep this going. So, deep appreciation for all of that, but mostly, again, for your practice. Namo Myodengekyo. Stay strong, take care of your health, and I'll see you in the next one. Namo Myodengekyo. Bye for now.